Well, welcome everybody. This is Dean Tenney, aka the Series 7 Guru. Just remind me, Zelda's biggest fan, and I'll go over solicitors after we uh, go over the question. If you're uh, new to our weekly live stream, we start with uh, briefs on, uh, you know, victorious test takers and what they saw. And so that's what we'll start with. I'll far, start our normal uh, pattern. Uh, when you're asking a question, so once I get done with the uh, debrief and uh, housekeeping, then we, uh, between then and the drawing at the end of the live stream, we answer questions. It's helpful to me, uh, particularly since I'm uh, here by my lonesome tonight, uh, if you can put a little Q or SIE followed by QR7, that way I know exam what, what question you're asking about. And I don't spend a lot of time, well, if it's this exam, then this is the answer. And if that exam, uh, it's not a big deal, but if you can remember to do that, that would be uh, helpful. Let me change our, there we go. So that would be helpful. Let's uh, get into our debrief. If you can chat amongst yourself if you'd like while I'm doing the debrief. Uh, and then, you know, we'll come come back and circle back and I'll start answering questions. So this is a 65, uh, 66 some debrief I've collected this week. Uh, this is kind of an odd one that I haven't had people say they've seen uh, before. I mean, it shows up on seven quite a bit. Uh, again, Omar, just put that back in. I'll try and remember. Let me take some notes. We want to talk about solicitor and we want to talk about math on 66. OK, let me get done with the, the stuff and I'll circle back on that. All right, so a preemptive right, uh, they had a question on preemptive right. Your preemptive right is your right to maintain proportion and ownership, right? So the way we do that is a rights offering, and rights are short-term and exercisable below. That's very testable on 7, and this is the first time I've heard of it showing up on 65, 66. Uh, people always say, and I don't know what to make of this, that they got more preferred stock questions than they thought. And I just want to tell you, 65, 66, you do get tested on preferred stocks, particularly cumulative preferred stocks. So remember, cumulative preferred stocks go into arrears. Uh, you need to be able to distinguish between futures and options. You know, in futures, you don't have a right or obligation. You simply go long or short the futures. So make sure you can distinguish between this idea of option contracts versus futures. Uh, again, options and futures, 65, 66 is not enough to kill you, but, you know, it's there. Um, uh, question about insider trading and are you guilty of insider trading if you have a sell stop that you placed before you were in possession of material non-public information and then it goes off and the answer is no. Uh, share class has a break point. That's the A share. Quick ratio comes up all the time. Is rebalancing strategic or tactical? It's strategic. Uh, here's the... Um, uh, you're not asked on this. We'll talk about the math on uh, 65, 66. A lot of the higher end math, you're not asked to do it. You're just asked to recognize it. Total return, that's pretty standard fare in terms of math, total return. Uh, let's see, uh, after tax yield, pretty pretty standard fare. Uh, does the administrator have powers to arrest somebody? The answer is no, they do not. They have to go to a judge to get that done. Uh, record keeping, remember, for broker dealers is the SEC and FINRA, not the state administrator. If it's the investment advisory firm, then it's, you know, going to be five years. I got an no beta, no surprise there. Uh, solicitors, there we go. So I'll answer that Omar for you in just a bit. Oh, man, if you miss this one, you should flunk the entire debt test. What happens if interest rates rise to bond prices in your customer's portfolio? You should definitely know that. Uh, the distinction between a general partner having unlimited risk and limited partners having limited risk, pretty standard fare. How many shareholders in an S-corp? Pretty standard kind of a question. Uh, qualified institutional buyer securities in net. We'll talk about that in just a sec. That's on almost all the exams. Uh, doo, 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 doo. Okay, so uh, let me now go to our other debrief here. I, I just gave you what we got from that debrief. One of the uh, legal terms you should be aware of and sometimes is used on the test is called a safe harbor. So if you're ever talking to an attorney and you say, is there a safe harbor? Well, you're asking that attorney, is there a way to do something without getting into trouble? You know, as it relates to us as test takers, there are safe harbors from 33. 
You know, 33 says you're going to sell brand new securities to the public. You need to make a registration statement. But there are exempt securities and exempt transactions. Those are safe harbors. So for all of you as test takers, you should be aware of a pipe, a private investment in a public entity. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, Mark Cuban was a major shareholder in this company, and the company wanted to raise money quickly, and so they wanted to sell some unregistered securities, private investments. So what they wanted to do is sell set, uh, unregistered securities. So the CEO reached out to Mark Cuban and said, hey, Mark, we know that you're a major shareholder. You know, we've seen the 13D. We know you're a major shareholder. And the reason I'm reaching out to you is I'd like you to buy, make a, pri a private investment in our public stock this public entity. I want to sell you restricted unregistered stock. And then the idea here is that, uh, you know, you hold it six months, you register it and you can make some money. Uh, you know, after he hung up the phone, Mark thought, man, this CEO is such a clown that he not only did not participate, he sold all the stock. He dumped his stock. Now Mark can participate. So it doesn't have to be Mark Cuban, accredited investor that's participating in the pipe. This is on the SIE. This is on the seven. This is on the 24, the 10. So we can have a, what we call qualified institutional buyers of securities. And that's what 144A is about. 144A says that a qualified institutional buyer of securities can buy unregistered foreign and domestic securities. So that means that in my example of the pipe, a quib could certainly participate. Right? They can participate because they can buy pretty much everything, anything they want because they're capable of protecting their own assets, their own interests. And to be a quib test question, you have to have assets under management of a hundred million or more. So don't confuse the two things. A pipe is a certain type of transaction and a 144A is what allows quibs to buy unregistered foreign and domestic securities. And so they certainly can participate. The safe harbor that we're discussing here is called Reg D. Reg D is a private placement. It's by invitation only. It's not a public distribution. So this is, you know, where we call and Mark Cuban's accredited or it's a quib I'm calling or an institutional buyer. It's not Joe Sixpack is the point. Now, another safe harbor available under 33 that you get tested on is Reg A. Reg A is not Bob Marley music. It is another safe harbor or exemption available under 33. Now, if I'm going to use Reg A, what mostly is the test question is I can only raise up to $75 million. That's primarily the most often high probability test question. But there is two tiers. There's tier one where I can raise up to $20 million. I'm raising it from the public, by the way. And tier two, up to $75 million. But again, it's an exemption from 33. So I don't have to make an S1. I don't have to go in the cooling off period. Now, if I go past that $20 million into tier two, then the, the buyer can only put 10% of their net worth or their annual income, whichever is greater. And the issuer would have to have uh, fi audited financial uh, statements. So those are some of the ones to do it. Okay, so our last one is what's been showing up as a transfer on death, not so much that it avoids probate, but yes, that it's anonymous, right? So they have a question that goes something about an aunt that wants to leave her transfer on death to her, her nephew. And she's worried about her nephew finding out and trying to knock her off. I'm joking. I'm being facetious. But does she have to tell the nephew that uh, he is the uh, named beneficiary in the transfer on death? And the answer is no. And, you know, if she doesn't want to tell the nephew that, she doesn't certainly doesn't have to. All right. So that uh, concludes our debrief. How we start our uh, live streams. I just want to say thank you so much for a record January. Oh, my goodness. We're coming up on a million five views. We just cost 13,000. Uh, subscribers. And I uh, just want to say thank you so much. Uh, as the channel has expanded and evolved, I asked and put up polls and please participate because, you know, I want to do what you want to do and, you know, as viewers and subscribers. And uh, we've been asking for some additional things. And so I have added some additional things, not on the channel. The channel is completely free and will remain completely free. But I have uh, added some evening classes. And so one of the evening classes I've uh, added is on the seven most tested option strategies. That would be uh, $45. It's 90 minutes. It's February 15th, 5.30 p.m. We will be adding that to our drawing at the end of the thing. You can do that. I cap it at 10. We got a couple spots left. And that's what we'll be discussing in, in that class. So that's available. 
if uh, you want to participate in that. We also uh, have, uh, if you want to uh, check those out, you go to deantinneytutoring.setmore.com. And that tells you not only about those classes, I've got five of them up there so far. Uh, and then it also, that's where you book tutoring stuff. So you can check that out. At the end of our drawing, at the end of our live stream, again, if you're new and just joining us, we always do a drawing and it'll be a 30 minute coaching call Thursday, February 16th, 5 p.m. Uh, if you win, then you need to tell me within an hour by email, and I'll put my email up at the end, uh, that you won. And then I send you a Zoom invite for that coaching call. So uh, that's how the coaching call works. Let me get rid of that. Uh, Brian and I are looking on a podcast pilot. So if you have any names, suggestions, uh, Brian just sent me the script. I haven't had time to look at He's kind of plotted out five episodes so far. Brian is the test geek. We're thinking of calling it geek and geek and guru, you know, whatever. <laughs> we'll figure it out. Uh, with Thursdays, we do premieres. Uh, this uh, Thursday's premiere is what is the percentage and how many days? Oh, I got a typo there. If you want to check that out, you can do the video description and uh, get a sneak peek on it. Uh, in terms of using the channel, the way you do it is find your playlist. Your playlist, somebody just said they're working their way through the SIE playlist. There's, I don't know, 60 videos in there. I have them in suggested watch order. But it's a buffet. Take what you like, leave what you don't. I appreciate your participation on the community page because that's how I decide what we're going to do and what we're not going to do in terms of uh, the channel. Uh, and best free supplement is the YouTube channel. But if you need a paid supplement, uh, I highly recommend a Kaplan QBank as well as Kaplan Quick Sheets. I just got my Kaplan schedule. I'll be teaching an SIE uh, the first month of each quarter. So that would be April. And then I'm going to teach a Kaplan Series 7 uh, second uh, month of the quarter, which is May and then a 66 in June. So uh, you can sign up for those classes or buy QBanks or, you know, or Quick Sheets, whatever you'd like. If you want to use uh, Test Geek as a paid supplement, again, highly re recommended. That's Brian. The discount code is uh, Guru20. Uh, and for Kaplan, is Guru10, 10% 10 off. Oh, that was from last week. Okay, it looks like we're ready to uh, go check out what you guys have been doing in the comments. Let me just uh, be patient with me today. As I say, though, let me get rid of that banner. Uh, I'm on my own today. Uh, Ryan's significant other wanted him to uh, participate here in the Vegas show. So let's see. Boo, doo, 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 doo. Okay, so Zelda's biggest fan. Are there math questions on, on solicitors? There are. So Zelda, I spent a, a big part of my career as a third-party solicitor for a federally covered investment advisor. So typically the third party solicitor is a broker dealer, who cares? What we care about is that I have to make it clear to the client that I'm representing the investment advisory firm and not the customer. So I have to have two separate brochures. Here's a brochure that tells you about Gamma Global, my broker dealer that is the third party solicitor promoter. And here's a brochure that tells you about, for example, Carlisle. You know, I was a private placement agent for Carlisle. And then Carla is going to send an acknowledgement to you, Zelda, that I didn't misrepresent myself as being somebody representing uh, Carlisle. So those are the two major things. Two separate brochures and the investment advisory firm gets a uh, acknowledgement that the brochures were delivered. And then uh, whether there's a uh, additional compensation. So Zelda, in my case, uh, Carlisle is going to charge you 2% of the assets under management, 20% of the profits. And they're simply giving me the 2% for raising the money for them. So that it doesn't cost you additional monies to access Carlisle through the third party solicitor. Now that may be different, but if it is, if I say there's an extra 1%, well then, you know, I have to disclose that. So SIE Central Iowa. I love Iowa. Are you at uh, Cambridge by, by chance? Uh, I used to teach at Lafayette there in, uh, in uh, Iowa. And I used to go to the Casey's General Store and get breakfast pizza. It sounds terrible, but it's really pretty damn good. And Clyde, I spent a lot of time teaching in Alpharetta, Georgia. What's that, Highway 400, I think, where you go there? New York City. Uh, it took effect to eliminate. Yeah, they're just called promoters now. So it's called a promoter, and we haven't had to tell anybody say that they've seen the word promoter yet. Yeah, people still are seeing solicitors, so. though. 63 is an agent of the broker-dealer, and 66 is an agent of the broker-dealer and an investment advisory firm. So, you know, if you have a 63, you, that doesn't let you represent an investment advisory firm. 
So that's the difference. So 66 means you're just going to be an agent of a broker dealer. 66 is both a 65 and a 63 are the equivalent of a 66. Uh, math problems. You definitely got to be able to do current yield. You definitely got to be able to do total return. Uh, you should definitely be able to do liquidity ratios on a balance sheet, the current ratio, uh, the quick ratio. You should definitely be able to do working capital. Uh, Omar, what I've done is because people uh, have said they want to do things that I think don't lend themselves well to a live stream. So one of the things I've added, Omar, is an overtime for the live stream, and that'll be at deantennysetmore.com. There's a Q&A session there. It's no charge and it's a Zoom. And if you want to join me over there at 630, when we close this down, I will be over there and I'm more than happy to show you that math if you'd like. But there's there's certainly math on the uh, 65 and 66. Omar, the analytical method part, the internal rate of returns, uh, you know, uh, discounted cash flow, um, uh, net present value, that stuff is mainly recognition. So I think a lot of people go down rabbit holes, Omar, on 65, 66 math that they're not going to see. So, you know, don't overdose on it. If you tell me you missed it, missed the 65, 66 because of math, I'm going to say, eh, you had bigger problems somewhere. All right. Who's your, Mary, who's your instructor? Is it uh, Jim Nash or Marcus Pizzito or Bill Yee? Uh, I'm a big believer, Mary. So everybody's a little different. So. You know, one of the things you got to avoid is having too many voices in your head. <laughs> so, you know, you got to pick somebody you trust and kind of stick with it. That You know, I'm usually Mary, a good a fan of study groups, but not if it's just a bunch of confused people. So whether it's too many instructors you're talking to or too many people, uh, but here's my theory. So I think you should do as many questions as possible. And I've heard people say you shouldn't do any questions the day before the exam, which I think is kind of not good advice because... You don't want to lose that rhythm that you're trying to establish. So you're not only doing practice exams to do an intellectual inventory and get a mark, but you're also trying to build up your rhythm and knowing what it feels like to go through X number of questions. So if I were your accountability partner, Mary, one of the things I would really be interested in is your QBank usage. And, you know, if I was your accountability partner and you missed the mark, the first thing I would do is look and see, you know, how many questions you used, how many questions you did in the QBank. Woohoo! Uh, Victor, that's 66. I do all the series in 60 minutes. And uh, I can't tell you how many people think it. I just had a guy today and he said he just uh, helped him put him in the right flow, that he was he had lost his confidence. And then he listened to the 60 minutes and got his confidence back. Hey, if it's just that, I think that's uh, great. Uh, again, you would find my series, whatever series you're taking in 60 minutes in your playlist. So there's a SIE in 60 minutes, a seven and 60 minutes, a six and 60 minutes. So my idea, I had a guy I was tutoring today and he said he already listened to it. And he's not testing for two weeks. I go, well, that's not really what you should, what I want you to do. I want you to listen to the night before or morning of to kind of get that last minute. It's not a teaching tool. It's more of a, you know, last minute kind of get you a couple points perhaps. Ugh, that's so aggravating. Sure. Settlement dates, I can do it pretty quickly. So we have same day. Let me just make a note here, 2147. So same day, this is all based on what's called the Uniform Practice Code. The Uniform Practice Code standardizes practices within the securities industry. So you can imagine what a mess it would be if everybody was conducting business differently. So we all agree to conduct business the same way. It's called the Uniform Practice Code. That alone could be a test question. Which of the following standardizes business practices within the securities industry? And you would say the Uniform Practice Code. Now, regular way, we assume people are doing business regular way. That's why we call it regular way settlement. For corporates and munis, very testable on the SIE, it's T plus two. For corporates and municipal securities. It's T plus one for options and T plus one for government securities. Now, if you don't want to do a trade regular way, if you want to do it an irregular way, one way you can do a trade is for cash settlement. And cash settlement would be same day. Now, we don't tell customers this, Cynthia, because we don't want to use broker dealer money to pay for their securities. But Reg T, that's Federal Reserve Board, part of 34, says customers get two additional days. So we don't really tell them that, but regular way of settlement is T plus two. So if I'm a margin clerk, the customer actually gets T plus two plus two 
total of four to come up with monies or securities. You know, settlement means when ownership changes hands, when the money is going to be debited or credited to your brokerage account. And, uh, you know, if you don't pay, then we're going to sell you out. And if we sell you out because you didn't pay, then you're going to have taken a free ride, ride you didn't pay for, and we're going to freeze your account for 90 days. And that means no credit privileges. Uh, we also have DVP, delivery versus payment, and that's up to 35 calendar days. So those are the, all the various forms of settlements that you would encounter. It would be a recognition question, just A, B, C, D, and then you got to pick it out of the, the lineup. You can't be giving up recognition questions. Recognition questions are flashcard stuff. It's simply stuff you either know or you don't know. A uh, serial bond means different maturity dates, like a serial killer. They kill at different times. Uh, I'm not sure, Amy, what your point is about level debt service. I wouldn't imagine you're going to see that on the SIE. Uh, but you series means different issuing dates. Serial means different maturity dates. Term means all the bonds come due at one time. So if you mean by level debt service, you would not You would have different maturity dates. So you would have to come up with some more money along the way, so to speak. But the coupon payment would be the same. I'm not sure what you mean by level debt service. Level debt service is certainly not an SIE test term. Hello. Hey, Erica, how's it going? When does the Fed, well, right now, Erica, you're living in a moment of where the Fed is tightening. So the Fed is cutting down on the money supply by raising interest rates. And so they're raising interest rates and that's tight money, right? Jerome Powell just uh, was discussing, uh, I've had the honor and privilege to tutor David Rubenstein, the co-founder of Carlisle. He was interviewing Jerome Powell today on, at the Economics Club in DC. And, uh, you know, kept trying to get him to, to be loose-lipped loose about monetary policy. You won't get tested, Erica, on your seven. You got tested on your SIE. Now, Erica, the reason you're still encountering practice questions on this, on your seven, is because nobody has got rid of the seven questions that are now in the SIE. So if you're taking an SIE, it's very testable. No monetary policy is the money supply. It's controlled by the Federal Reserve Board. And they, uh, Erica, Jerome said today in the interview I was watching that he, the balance sheet of the Fed is shrinking. The balance sheet of the Fed is shrinking, right? So that means they're not buying anymore any bonds. They haven't started really kind of selling. They're letting the bond portfolio kind of roll off. But shrinking money means higher interest rates, right? Now they loosen credit to get things, uh, you know, go and get, reignite those animal spirits. So right now the Fed is tightening. They're still tightening. And the market and the Fed are debating, right? The market thinks the Fed is going to uh, stop tightening at some point sooner than the Fed has said. They said, well, we don't know. It's to be determined when we'll stop tightening. Tightening means raising interest rates. Uh, you should definitely know if you're taking the SIE, the buying government securities causes the money supply to go up and interest rates to go down. And if you're taking the SIE or 65 for that matter, you should know when the Fed sells government securities, money supply goes down, interest rates go up. And if you're taking the 65 or SIE, you should know that when interest rates go up, the dollar gets stronger. I wouldn't worry about any of that in any other exam except uh, those. The other thing you get tested on both SIE and 65 is fiscal policy. That's government spending and taxation. I kind of like it. Jerome is the chairman of the Fed. And he was asked by David. Dave, by the way, David's a cool guy because he, he knows this stuff already, but he's trying to throw him softballs. Could you tell us a little bit about the Federal Reserve? He goes, well, we got 12 banks. We got seven presidents, you know. <laughs> of the Fed, different banks, and he was giving kind of a primer on the on the Federal Reserve Board, which I thought was kind of nice. But anyways, he asked him about uh, monetary, uh, excuse me, fiscal policy, and he said, uh, Jerome said, that's not our mission. We don't get involved in uh, fiscal policy. Te that's a test question, government spending, taxation, and it's controlled by Congress and the president. Uh, so, you know, I thought that was kind of an interesting conversation. Uh, it's hard to believe, but David is a billionaire, and he asked what uh, Jerome Powell gets. What do you think the chairman of the Fed gets paid? What a public service he's doing for us, $190,000 a year. That's just ridiculously low to be in charge of monetary policy. And then David said to him, uh, is that enough? And he said, yeah, that's that's plenty. I'm like, wow. You know? <laughs> simplify, Jerome, simplify. All right. Well, hello, hello. Hey, that's great. Kudos on passing your seven. Uh, do you have anything left? You got to do a 63 or 66 or is that it? Are you complete that? Yeah, well, we're going to do the podcast. So the podcast uh, is coming. Uh, you know, we're just scripting it out. I told Brian I'd be in charge of the audience and he can be in charge of doing the uh, production. So he just sent me the uh, notes and I haven't had a chance to review them yet. So 
it looks like we're going to have like five episodes as a trial and then see what, you know, see what happens. Like anything, we try it out, see what happens. And it is going to be the word there this week. We're going to have two words. I'm going to try to do two drawings. I'm going to do a drawing for the basic options. I'm going to do a drawing for the coaching call. So we'll have two drawings at the end of the call. And I'll see if I can use a different word on the second one. I'm not sure I'm capable of doing that yet, but we'll try. Um and the other thing we've added is you can't win twice. So Marcel got, I, I mean, he's a lucky guy. I like Marcel, but uh, new rule. If you win this week, don't put your thing in next week because we don't want to have different winners. So, you know, I'll, I call that the Marcel rule. He's got a new rule. Yeah, I think I went over that already. I think I went over that. Yeah, well, well you know, it's fixed. Oh, well, fixed annuities, Eric, I remember, are not a security. So again, I don't think you're going to see a fixed annuity on your Series 7 because it's not a security. If it is, it's just to contrast it with a variable annuity. Uh, where you will see a fixed annuity is if you're taking 65 or 66, you will encounter a question about an equity indexed annuity, an equity indexed annuity. And what you need to know there is no negative reset. So taxation wouldn't be on a fixed annuity because again, it's not a security. Uh, the taxation questions would be on a variable annuity, knowing you're using after-tax money, money you've already paid taxes on. And so when you are 59 and a half and you either annuitize or get the money, uh, you're going to have some money you owe taxes on and some you don't. Some of the money is going to be a return of your original capital that you put in there, your deposit that you paid taxes on. So plenty of examples of that in practice questions. I'll just give you a quick one. I put 500 grand in a variable annuity, uh, 59 and a half, there's a million. If I do a uh, randomly take a distribution, it's going to be LIFO, last in, first out. If I annuitize, half my payment is going to be uh, not taxable. Uh, you have to, on the rights of accumulation, Amy, be able to contrast them with breakpoints. So an LOI is not about rights of accumulation. So a letter of intent is on the A shares, that's testable, and it's a quantity discount. So I say, Amy, if you invest $100,000 or more in the Franklin funds, you get uh, a 3% sales charge. And so you say, well, how much should I invest? And I say, Amy, you should invest $99,999. Because that load is 4% and there'll be another $1,000 in commissions. Test question number one, that is a violation of the code of conduct. The code of conduct is the ethical behavior that broker dealers and associated persons owe customers. So breakpoints are good, quantity discount, breakpoint sales are bad. So Amy says, well, Dean, for my initial investment, all I have is, uh, you know, $80,000. I said, well, Amy, do you think over the next 13 months, you might be able to come up with, this is testable on every exam, another 20 grand? Because if so, we should fill out a letter of intent. And that can be backdated 90 days. That's very testable. She said, well, Dean, I can no way I'm coming up with it. I said, okay, well, let's at least get you a test point, Amy, rights of accumulation. What you have to be able to do on the exam is contrast rights of accumulation with a breakpoint. So, Amy, with the 80 grand we we're discussing, with rights of accumulation, you're paying 4% and you're getting no rebate. Done deal. But when you do cross on that and all subsequent investments, you get to reduce sales charge. So, you've got to be able to know the rights of accumulation. There is no time limit, but you don't get to reduce sales charge until you prove you're a good customer. The quantity discount. And with a letter of intent, breakpoint, you get it up front. So you got to be able to contrast that. Uh, I would definitely think in terms of recognition, Amy, you're going to get tested on the SIE. It's all testable on all exams, but you definitely know that LOI is 13 months, can be backdated 90 days. Uh, you should know about the A share is where that would be significant. <laughs> well, I don't know. It's, it's not what we're here. Uh, either the promoter finds you or you find the promoter, you know, uh, you find the promoter. <laughs> it's kind of like a chicken and egg. I kind of joke in the beauty contest, you're either a judge or a contestant. So, and, you know, like in my case, uh, I was, uh, I told you blessed enough to tutor, this is ridiculous, tutoring uh, David Rubenstein. And, you know, I, he said, well, how are you going to stay in my mix? I said, I don't know. It's not your job to figure out how Dean's going to stick around. I said, I'll figure that out. And so the way I figured that out was to be a third party solicitor. I said, hey, how about I help you? Go find investors. You know. Woo! -hoo! There you go, David. Thank you so much for coming to our. I just love it when victorious test takers come to the live stream, David. So 
Thank you so much because you don't have to take my word for it. I don't know why you wouldn't take my word for things, but it's always neat when someone else can share that with you. As I told you, if you tell me that you missed the 65 or 66 due to math, I'm going to say you had other problems. And then what happens is people go down the rabbit hole in the math. I mean, the people who are good on it, love it, and they spend too much time on it. People aren't good would be better served sending their time elsewhere in regulations and other things. So, uh, you know, David, thanks for confirming what test takers need to know. Yeah, Chuck is a very eccentric guy. So, you know, <laughs> I just sent Chuck. Chuck is in Israel. So, I just sent him an email. Uh, about three hours ago on that debrief, good debrief. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure I'll get it from him in the morning at like, you know, 2 a.m. Uh, you know, people, Zelda, I don't know why people make fun of old guys. I'm an old dude. But listen, if you're new in this thing, I don't think you want somebody too new, right? I wouldn't want to say, hey, this is the first time I ever got to help somebody through their 66. <laughs> so something to be said for the old dudes, but including Chuck. All right. So uh, Chuck knows his stuff. Uh, I think that's really key. There's a direct correlation between Q bank usage. So, I mean, you know, we can say all you want, but I get, like I say, if I'm a big brother accountability partner, you know, if you're working like at Vanguard, they have an administrator key, you know, or Morgan Stanley or Merrill Lynch, where they can go backstage and see what you're doing. I used to tell my baby brokers, that's a term of endearment, that yeah, let's come up with a study plan. And it includes reading, it includes watching videos. Uh, doing practice questions, but what I what I need to track is activities I can see, and what the people are trying to help you. By the way, the accountability partners are are good people; they're trying to help you, you know. But I I used to ask people how many questions you're going to commit to each day. Is it going to be 25 questions, 50 questions, 100 questions, you know? And then I would look backstage, and if you didn't do it, I'd call you and say, "Hey, I just went backstage and saw that you told, said you were going to do 100, and you did 25." Now I I would say, Mary, if you're using past perfect. I added a margin lecture to those classes I'm offering. I think I set it at like 60 bucks and you don't need it. It's a waste of your $60. But the only reason I put it there for $60 is I've had people taking Pass Perfect pay me $225 an hour to do Pass Perfect margin practice questions they're never going to encounter on the actual exam. So I thought, well, you know, if, if there's people that are doing that, and the sad part, by the way, is I know that some firms that use Pass Perfect, for example, are locked, meaning they won't let you go to unit 19 until you do unit 18. So, you know, I put it up there and, uh, you know, people need help on that. They can certainly, you know, take, take advantage of that. Uh, I sent you, Eric, a, a video that's on the channel on the hellacious margin questions uh, from, you know, past perfect that somebody, you know, wants to spend an hour going over. So uh, can I touch on these types of questions? Well, tax implications. So, it's pretty, you know, I think people make more complicated than it is. Okay, so this is my brief overview. There's a taxation lecture. And I'll, at this type stamp, I'll put it there for you. Now, there seems to be some disagreement, user one, two, three, four, that Dean doesn't answer questions and then puts a video. That's not true. I do both. I'm about to answer your question, and then I'm going to link to a 30-minute video. Again, I don't have 30 minutes in the live stream, but I have a real brief thing. So the idea is I'm going to turn my money into an investment. So, you know, uh, I'm pretty blessed. I have enough money working for me that I don't need to work for my money. So, you know, sometimes I get into it with somebody. I said, listen, if you, you don't want to tutor or buy a class, what do I care? I mean, you know, I'm not here to solicit that. That's not, I'm not who I am as a full-time person. Anyway, so when I turn the money into an investment, this is 91 questions, right, about investments. I can turn it into a stock. I can turn it into a bond. That's called my cost basis. So cost basis is simply when I turn the money into the investment. Now, at some future date, I'm going to turn the investment back into money. Right. And what I'm hoping is that I have more money. Right. And that's going to be called my sales proceeds. So let's say that today I buy a thousand shares of Apple at 142. So $142 a share, 142,000 is my cost basis. Again, that's what represents when I turn the money into the investment. Now, that's assuming I'm talking about my personal account. I, you have three baskets. You have your portfolio, your paycheck. That's Dean working for money, right? So those people that pay me $45, that's Dean working for money. That bucket is my paycheck, my earned income. We don't really care about that on the, on the test. Then we have my portfolio that we do care about. That's my money working for me. That's where the vast majority of the test questions are on taxes. 
And then we have passive and that's my partnerships. Okay, so now I'm gonna turn the Apple back into money. So let's say now Apple's 200. So I had a thousand shares, now I'm gonna have $200,000. That's my sales proceeds. So 142,000, 200,000. I'm terrible at arithmetic. Let me get my calculator. Uh, 200 minus 142. That's a $58,000 taxable gain. So the next thing is how long was I at risk in the Apple? Because if I was at risk for more than 12 months, that's going to be taxed at uh, what I say it was, the 58,000 bucks is going to be taxed at uh, long-term capital gains rate, which is typically lower than my ordinary income tax rates. So if I haven't held it, haven't been at risk for more than 12 months, then that tax is going to be based on my ordinary income tax rate. Uh, dividends, cash dividends are taxable. Uh, there's a difference between the taxation of an ordinary dividend and a qualified dividend. Qualified dividends are at a lower tax rate. There is no tax consequence to receiving a stock dividend or stock split. I just have to adjust my cost basis. So that's those are some high uh, high risk ones I would think about. Uh, somebody, uh, Eric, well, Eric, I asked about variable annuity. I definitely know the tax consequences of a variable annuity. I definitely know a qualified plan. You're putting pre-tax money in. So you have a zero cost base. So everything I'm going to have is going to be taxable. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. That sounds about right. So thank you so much, David. That sounds about right. Uh, the life insurance question I would be aware of, but I don't know if you saw David on yours, is a uh, needs analysis, a capital needs analysis to see how much insurance somebody needs if they're no longer around, right? Yeah, I wish I had something for that. If I had a magic pill for that, I'd be rich, wouldn't I? So I had somebody today on social media, all their scores indicate they're going to be successful. And I told him, you just got to guard your psyche. It's okay to tell some people, hey, I'm emotionally fragile. I'm I'm testing on the 15th. You know, anything you could do to, you know, not make me go wobbly would be helpful. So stay away from negative energy people. Well, that, that sounds terrible. Well, then clever, then, you know, but margins like options. And if you had 10, well, then hopefully, I, you know, you, you spent the time or money or resources to learn options. But once, or excuse me, margin. But once you learn margin, there's no way to trick you. Right. So that's the good news without margin. It's kind of like options. Once you get it, you say, give me 125 margin questions. Yeah, that's a good score. 70 is where I think you're not at risk. I, we could certainly push that higher. I'd like you to be higher than that. I'm nervous when you're below 60 or below 70, 70 60 to 70, your risk below 60 means you, you, you're not, you know, you should reschedule. But uh, 60, 70, a risk above 70, I think you're pretty good. Uh, you left me on read with emails. I think Erica, I gave you a coaching call that went to 45 minutes and you won. Did, did that, am I imagining that? Didn't I spend 45 minutes with you going over spreads and straddles? Oh, you expect to win again tonight. Well, uh, I, I think you're asking, is the Marcel rule apply to you? I don't know. I'll, I'll leave it to the audience. I'll throw it to chat. Do you think Erica should be eligible to win uh, I gave that to her because she's loyal, she's dedicated, she's disciplined. She wasn't actually the winner. It was a scholarship, so to speak. So I'll throw it to the chat and we'll get to the end of the thing. We'll decide, Erica, whether you are subject to the uh, Marcel rule or you're exempt from the Marcel rule. <laughs> uh, indexes, yeah. D David, uh, definitely make sure you know the indexes. So you should know that uh, Dow Jones is the only price-weighted uh, index. Uh, you should know that the VIX is based on the S&P 500. Uh, you should know that that would be the best benchmark for a uh, 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 mutual fund manager, major mutual fund, big cap mutual fund. Uh, Russell 2000, small cap. Uh, you should definitely know Wilshire 5000 reflects the total stock market. You should know that EFA is for uh, in benchmarks for in uh, international. Now, when you get that, it's typically A, B, C, D. So, you know, you'd have to pick it out of the mix, so to speak. One suitability question, that is odd. No trust question, that is odd. Well, I can't let you win. The raffle is not fixed. I have no control. It's a complete coincidence that Marcel won twice. So we put the things in there and then it's the Wheel of Fortune does what the Wheel of Fortune does, so. Uh, not major, you know, usually what they do is they put out a notice. I, I Bloom Eagle, I, I highly recommend you go get from the FINRA website the FINRA uh, content outline for the SIE. I actually explicate that. It's the first five videos in the SIE playlist. 
And whether it's series seven or 66, whatever exam you're taking, I always suggest you go print the PDF of either the content outline or NASA calls it test specifications and have that next to you as you study. So sometimes people say, well, how do you know it's not on the test? I say, well, if it's not in the content outline or test specifications, they're not allowed to ask it. So they do change it, but uh, very rarely. The other thing is make sure you do the FINRA SIE practice test as well. I would save that till the end. And then uh, Bloom Ego, there's like, I think I have five uh, SIE practice tests. I have two Kaplan's, a test geek, myself, the FINRA, and I'll probably have another one up uh, soon from uh, Notman. Okay, so Oscar says he wants to win too. So I think he's saying he doesn't want you in the pool because that would improve his odds, I guess is what he said. Woohoo! Yeah, the videos, uh, you know, I'm proud of my videos. I mean, you know, there's 350 of them now. Remember, it's a free supplement to your paid materials. So it's not, you know, sometimes people give me grief. I'm like, well, listen, what did you pay for these videos? I mean, <laughs> you know. It depends, Cheryl, what your background is. I think the 65 is really, really a challenge. If you're a tabula rasa, a blank slate, and you're coming to this from some other industry, it's a lot of stuff. Cheryl, that 65 playlist has like 70 videos in it just because, you know, you know you, some people need to power up on the investments because they don't have a six and they're coming to a new field. It can be a real challenge. So how long it would take you to study depends on what you, what you bring to the 65 before you start your study effort. But I would say anywhere from four to eight weeks is what I would say. And again, that also would depend, Cheryl, on whether you're a full-time studier or a part-time studier. So that would be, you know, what I would suggest, Cheryl, is a, here's what I suggest to everybody. Come up with your study plan. And then, you know, once you come up with your study plan, run it for about 20 hours and see where you're at in terms of the things you have attached you put on there. How long is it taking you to read or do questions or watch videos and either expand or collapse, right? If you had eight weeks and you said, man, I think I can do it in six or... If you had four or first couple of weeks, you think, ah, I'm going to need another week. You should definitely get your test date, though, before you do. You want a test date to reverse engineer that. So, right. So once you decide it's four to eight weeks, then you set your test date and then you reverse engineer from there. Yeah, Fallon, I think they're very similar, right? I say, David, for me to do a really do good job for you over time, I need to know a lot about you. A balance sheet is a picture in time. And then, you know, what we're trying to do is look for opportunities here. And they do ask, I don't know, David, if you've got it, they ask us sometimes about items that would go on an income statement versus things that would go on a balance sheet. So you're like annual income wouldn't be on a balance sheet. That would be on an income statement, right? And there's a stupid question, David, that comes up all the time. I just had somebody in debrief tell me, it's not again, on a sofa. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and where is that an asset? And the answer is yes. Well, again, Cynthia, so uh, I told you I'm adding overtime to this. I am adding an overtime session at deantinneytutoring.setmore.com. It's no charge. You can go over there. And, and good news, it's a Zoom, and we can see each other. And, uh, you know, I can certainly work a couple examples of that. So before I call it quits here tonight, I'll ask, what do you want to talk about? Who's going to go over there? There's nobody in there right now because I just set it up for this purpose. But uh, let's go over that. So you got it kind of backwards in this regard. So a stop is a suspended either market order or limit order. I'm saying to my broker, stop the market, stop the loss, stop the bleeding. I don't know, Cynthia, what, what test you're taking, but depending on your test will depend on how, how much of this you get. So if uh, I buy, let's go back to my Apple. I buy a thousand shares of Apple at 142. I say, you know, I think I want to stop the loss at approximately $3,000. So I'm going to put a sell stop at 139. I'm telling my broker that if Apple trades at or through 139, stop the bleeding, stop the loss. And so if it trades at or through, two separate events, by the way. Customers get confused about this all the time. I'm watching the tape go by on CNBC. I go, oh, that's my trade. I go, no, that's the trade that turned my suspended order into a live order. So once Apple trades at or through 139, live market order, immediate execution, best available price. And that's the number one use of a, a stop order is a stop a loss. Now, if you want, this would be very foolish. You could say, Dean, if it trades at or through 149, then I want to sell Apple for 148 or better. So when we pull the trigger, it can either be a market order or a limit order. And again, I'll 47.55. I will put a video on this. It's about 45 minutes. It's also one of the classes I'm offering 
in the evening. Now, the reason that's foolish is because you may or may not ever get execution. So when you get a sequence of trades as a test question, you're going to be a little careful on that one. You should definitely know whether you want a sell stop that turns into a market order or a sell stop that turns into a limit order. It's got to be below the current market price. So slobs over bliss is a memory aid device that's worth lots of points about where we place it. So Cynthia, same thing. We have buy stops. I sell short. I sell short 1,000 shares of Zoom at 85. I want it to go down. And I'm afraid it's going to go up. So what I might say is to my broker is place a buy stop at 88. It would trade down or through 88, buy back the borrowed stock, give it back to the person I borrowed it from, send me home. And right, that's a buy stop. And you can, you can have a buy stop that turns into a market order or a buy stop that can turn into a limit order. Again, on the test, you should know that a stop is better than a stop limit. And the reason it's better is because it only has one contingency at or through live market order. And you should know on the test, the stop limit isn't good. Because now you have two contingencies, two qualifiers. And the more contingency your qualifiers, the less likely it is to get executed. Well, this is another past perfect question, Erica, that you're never going to see on the actual exam. So, you know, I have a thousand shares. Let's talk about my Apple again. I bought an Apple, a thousand shares of Apple, 142. It hasn't been 12 months and Apple's at 200. I have an unrealized gain of $58,000. So I call my broker and I say, don't sell my Apple. I don't want to sell my Apple. I want to borrow a thousand shares of Apple. I want you to take my thousand shares and put them in the box, the vault. I want to sell short my Apple against the box, the vault position. So I'm selling the borrowed shares rather than selling my own. And then at the end of the year, or when I'm past the 12 month hold, I take the shares out of the box or vault. I give them back to the person I borrowed them from. That's used to defer taxation of a gain. Nobody has seen that on the Series 7 in years. And then I could draw 95% of the proceeds. That's a past perfect practice question. It is not a Series 7 question. I'd be prepared to do that. You should definitely know, Amy, that it's 8.5% is the max. And I'd be prepared to be able to take a POP minus NAV and divide by POP to come up with the percentage. And Amy, I would be prepared to take the NAV and divide by 100% minus the sales load and calculate the pop. Yes, I would be prepared to do that. Now, whether you see it or not, uh, I don't know, but I would be prepared to do that. By the way, Amy, I would tell you too, if you're taking the SIE, please note that's the first leg of your testing journey. And you everything you're doing is going to pay huge dividends on your other exams. So if you take the SIE and really work your ass off, you could probably test out of a six. I'm not suggesting that. I'm just saying, you know, you'll you'll, you'll say, woo, -hoo! you know, or, or seven or whatever you're going to do in the future. So lay that base. So, Amy, even if you don't get asked that on your SIE, I don't know what's coming next, a six or a seven, but you might encounter it then. And maybe you're taking a 63, 65. You can count it on the 65. You can count it on the 66. So that's just one of those formulas I would know. So there you go, 63. Uh, not a lot of questions there, so you got to be a little careful about how many you, you throw out, basically. Hey, Austin, thanks for joining us from uh, Facebook. We broadcast to uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, YouTube, and Twitter, and so always good to see our Facebook friends. I'm not big on Facebook, so Austin, you know, kick my butt with a message over there or send me something if I forget. To, I, what I do is post on YouTube, and I send. I know some people are Facebook people, so I put it over there, but I don't really pay as much attention to it as I as I should. Um, well, T-notes, the only risk you have in T-notes would be interest rate risk, right? Because you have no credit risk. So very testable to know on all exams, their best credit quality is that of the United States government. And in T-bills, you don't have interest rate risk, but T-notes you do because it's two to 10 years. Uh, you don't have any market risk. You don't have re reinvestment risk. I mean, you could, but the, the one they're looking for is interest rate risk, right? So I would know T-bills are the risk-free rate of return because you don't have credit risk or interest rate risk. I'd also know, Austin, I don't know what exam you're taking, but it really doesn't matter. This is kind of one of those fundamental things as well. Uh, you should definitely know that uh, T-bonds would have more risk, right? Because they'd be more than 10 years. So the longer the maturity and the lower the U coupon, long and low, the more volatility you're going to have. That's very testable. If you're taking a 65 or 66, that concept is called duration. Well, there you go. So David just told us you got duration. So, wow, good draw. So thanks for paying it forward. That's great, David. So duration is just that same concept, Austin, about volatility. And, you know, the longer, the higher the duration, the more volatility. What that means, longer term bonds. 
know, these people who are math geeks get upset when they see my teacher daughter because they go, Dean, that relationship is not linear. It's it's non-linear. It's convexity. You know, who cares? Hey, Michael, how are you? Uh, are we going to do that in our tutoring session? Are we going to do that tonight? <laughs> you want to do regs again? I'm not sure, Michael, whether you want to do regs here. I think I got you on the schedule for tutoring, I believe. Uh, so I'm not sure how many regs. You, you mean like what I did at the beginning at the top? Uh, reg A, Reg D, 144A. I'm not sure if that's what you're talking about. Just clarify, Michael, and I'll tell you whether I'm going to do it in the live stream. Do it on the Q&A session afterwards or do it in your tutoring session. I think I got the right Michael. Uh, listen, I'm I'm pretty good, but boy, there's a lot of people going on, and uh, I I have to change my set more thing because it gives me first names, and I had like four or five Michaels, and uh, this was a Michael guy taking an SIE, and this Michael I think of as I got the right Michael is taking a Series Ten, and those are entirely different exams. So I plugged into the session thing we're going to be talking about like the SIE, and it ended up being something completely different. There you go. Yeah, solicitors are typically, as I said, broker dealers. And then the reps of the broker dealer don't have to take a 6566. So I don't need a 6566 to be soliciting on behalf of a broker dealer who's working as an agent to the investment advisor. Uh, I'll let uh, Meredith, I'll let our victorious test takers and others respond to you in chat. Yeah, past perfect. I mean, good news about past perfect, it's too much. And too much is better than not enough, but you know, it's it's a lot. So the good news is if you're doing well on past perfect exams, you should have no problem. Uh, you know, but past perfect is the only th place where you're getting enough that I think I still recommend a Kaplan Q Bank just for confirmation. So you're you can kind of make a good a better guess about what is past perfect minutia and what is actually testable. They know they Adam James is Bill James's uh, son, so they are definitely related. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, Bill James, a good friend of mine. Bill James is the subject matter expert, and Adam James is now actually higher in the hierarchy at Kaplan than Bill is. Bill is kind of, kind of on the back nine, and I agree with you. They're both neat people. Um, you know, uh, Bill is, uh, he's just, he's just one of those human beings that are just, you know, you're not sure they really exist. <laughs> so I believe uh, in human depravity and original sin, <laughs> and uh, those guys are really cool guys. Well, they're not going to ask you to calculate the tax. So it depends on my tax bracket. But for long-term capital gains, you know it's lower. It's typically like 20% than ordinary income tax rates. And ordinary income tax rates based are based on how much money you're making. So you just need to know that $52,000 is going to be taxable. In my example, what was it? 58000 is going to be taxed at either ordinary or long-term. Yeah, I'd like to push that in the 70. Sure. Don't throw it to the chat. I think it's too late. I think it's too late. <laughs> I don't think anybody threw you under the bus. I don't see you in the chat. I don't know if I'm behind or not, Erica. I think we only had one person who said you shouldn't be able to participate. He didn't actually say that, but Zelda says Erica can play. All right. Yeah, independently prepared reprints need to be approved by principal. Yes. Um, well, remember, it's not called advertising. It's called retail communication. So retail communication would include advertising and retail communication would be more than 25 and that has to be approved pre-distribution. Correspondence is 25 or fewer and it can be approved pre or post distribution. Uh, no, I think we talked about Jess. I don't know if you joined us a little late, but we've talked about the math on the 66 a couple times already. And no, the answer is there will not be a lot of math on the 66. It'll be three or four questions. And the unfortunate part is we don't know which three or four, so you have to prepare for all of them. Uh, yeah, I think I said that there's a session, Erica, that I put over there at deantinneytutoring.setmore.com. It's called Q&A, free Q&A. It's a Zoom. And when we finish this up, I'm going to go over there. That won't be free for, for everybody at some point. Tonight, it's free for everybody. So I think somebody wanted me to go over stop and limits and whatever the things that would take me 10 or 15 minutes of other people's time on the live stream, I'm going to do over there. So, you know, I'll, I'll open up that Zoom and say, okay, what do you want to talk about? Uh, don't count on that every Tuesday. Like I say, eventually what that will be is a session for somebody who's bought a class. 
right? So you buy a class, and then we'll have that available to those folks who uh, I'm kind of I'm kind of uh, being a greedy bastard. I don't want to have channel memberships for two reasons. I just don't want to cl clutter the channel with anything other than free content. As we talked about last time, I don't want to sell coffee cups and T-shirts and channel memberships. It doesn't really speak to me. And, but I still want to have some kind of a channel membership thing. And I, if we're going to do that, I don't want to give Google like 30% to collect 20 bucks from you. So we're going to try and kind of simulate that over there. I don't know if it's going to work. So far, it's working pretty good. So we'll see. But that'll be tonight if you want to join me for an overtime session. Uh, is it a thing to just have to go through a practice exam with me and listen to me talk through questions and analyze? I might be missing the mark. Um, I don't know. People in tutoring sessions, Nikki, do like to do that. You know, I always say when you do an opening purchase and go along a tutoring session, we do whatever you want to do. And sometimes people do like to do questions together. I would say, Nikki, the free way to do that is just go to the 65 playlist. There's like five or six practice exams there, Nikki. And hit play and then hit pause, answer, hit play, and hear me explain it to you and tell you what the right question is. So, yeah, uh, I call that explications. They're very, very popular. And people tell me they're very, very helpful. So. Uh, I would definitely suggest you do that. And again, that's available free in the 65 playlist. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that, Eric. I didn't say not my favorite. I'm just teasing you. I'm a big tease. I'm just a big tease. So um, stabilizing bids are when we're doing an offering like at Facebook at 38. And if we have more sellers than buyers, the stock is going to go below 38. And nobody's going to buy my new stock at 38 if they can buy in the secondary market at 32. So in a firm commitment underwriting, the one member of the syndicate is going to be able to enter a stabilizing bid. No, it can be lower than the IPO price. It can't be above it because above the public offering price, it's not the IPO price, it's the public offering price. And so my example of Facebook IPO, the public offering price is at 38. We can't put that at 30, 38. One person, one member of the syndicate can, can enter it. Only one person can enter it. It's called the stabilization agent. And it has to be in the prospectus. And it's better to have it in the prospectus and not need it than need it and not have it. Uh, again, I have a whole uh, lecture in the 10 and 24 playlist on that. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm just teasing you, Eric. I'm going to let you participate. Yeah, the Series 10 videos, they got a whole playlist there for you. Yeah, a lot of people like to get a third-party content. So I also, Devin, had uh, Notman give me permission to use their 57 exam. And I'm going to probably put up a 24 from Notman. I'm assuming if the Notman goes well. If you're using Notman, tell me if you're you know, using the Series 7 Guru channel because I'm trying to ingratiate myself to get some ac more access to their content. I'll probably put up a, uh, a, a Notman SIE test as well. <laughs> No, no worries. No worries. You got to be strong. Just be strong. Listen, Eric, I already have haters in social media. So please, you know, don't really be crying or tell us you're not because then I, mean, I, I can already tell my haters going to say, oh, he puts people in tears. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> I think SDC is fine. Uh, I do recommend the QBank. Uh, the QBank, I can help you with the QBank. You can send me any question you want help on it. But, you know, if it's if it's SDC or past perfect, you got to cut and paste it. And if it's a Kaplan question, you can just send me the QID. Uh, there is already, Devin, there's a series 10 and 60 minute video. Yeah, it's there. So just remember, save it to the day before or day of. All right, kudos, kudos. So Simon's available to answer a question about 66. On rankings, well, the test question, if it's an independently prepared ranking, it doesn't need to have approval or uh, pre-distribution, but if it's not independently prepared, in other words, you're the one who came up with a ranking that makes you number one, then you have to send it to FINRA before your first use. There's tons of explanations on Series 7. There, if you go to the Erica, the Series 7, there's an entire playlist on Series 7 practice exams. There are literally 1,500 practice questions. There's nine practice exams. So it says need more practice. It's called need more practice. If you hit that, you'll see nine or 10 practice exams. I got more, I can listen. I got more practice questions than anybody anywhere for free. So yes, they're a combination of Teskey, Kaplan, my own, a Momentric. So we have a little bit of everything on there for you.
Well, it's not the legal counsel. It's the bond. It's the bond counsel, not the legal counsel. It's the bond counsel. And the legal opinion, well, the legal opinion has three things. Legislative authority to borrow the money. That's what they were opining about. The bonds are tax exempt and that it's exempt from the prospectus requirement. That's very testable. It's not a legal counsel. It's called a bond counsel. And the legal opinion is going to attest to uh, those three things. It's going to be qualified. That means with reservation, that's bad, or it's going to be unqualified without reservation. Okay, so it looks like we are ready for our uh, drawing. Give me a minute here to get this figured out. Share screen. Let me get rid of that. Okay, so podcast is the uh, thing to enter for the drawing. Let's say that these uh, first uh, one is for the coaching call. So remember, the coaching call is next Thursday, not this Thursday. It's 30 minutes. And you send me an email within an hour. We talk about whatever you want in the coaching call. It could be whatever you want. Jessica or uh, Erica want to do spreads and straddles. Whatever you want to do, I'm fine with that. It's helpful if you send me a little... Uh, Thing beforehand telling me what you want to talk about. Well, you should definitely know, Amy, that statements are quarterly, uh, unless there's a penny stock, which is monthly. I would definitely know what the uh, penny stock is. It's a non-NASDAQ stock under five. So every six months would be a mutual fund, and quarterly is for statements. Uh, the SP is an annual notice, but uh, I think you just need to deal with monthly and quarterly statements, monthly, penny stock, quarterly, otherwise, and then semi-annual for mutual funds. Okay, we got 20 entries. Any more? Okay, so this is going to be uh, for the coaching call. So here we go with the coaching call. All right, let's draw for the coaching call. All right, Amy's the winner on that one. So Amy, let me give you my email address. You got to send me this email within uh, one hour of uh, us getting off this uh, uh, live stream to claim your prize. And it's for next Thursday, 5 p.m. You can assign it to someone else if you'd like. You can share it with anybody you'd like. And, uh, you know, don't have to, but if you send me a little, you know, email about what you want to talk about, that would be helpful. All right, so let's uh, now get rid of that one. And let's try this again. Okay, this one is for the basic options class that uh, is going to be on February 15th, Wednesday. And let me just uh, get this uh, going again, fired up. And okay, let me. Share the screen. Okay, so chat is open. Uh, anybody got any ideas for what we're going to use for the next one? <laughs> Eric, you're funny. What a rip off. Uh, what's our next word? Anybody got any ideas? How about... Um, how about, well, I miss it too. I told you, Eric, I used to participate as well. Uh, leaps, okay, I like that. Leaps are long-term equity appreciation potential uh, exam. So leaps is the new uh, one to enter. And this is for uh, the 45 minute, uh, excuse me, 90 minute option class. If you don't want to win the option class, then don't participate. Don't put the entry in there. Okay, is that is there? Remember, if you don't want to win, then don't put put it in there, right? So you know, participation is optional. I'm gonna look, Eric, and see if you go by. I'll look and see if you go by this time. Okay, last call. Last call. 
Uh, by the way, it doesn't matter if you put it in more than once. The thing only picks it up once. So, all right, here we go. This is for the, uh, what I say this one is for? The options class. Eric, I saw your name go by. So, Nikki, uh, same thing. Send me an email, and I'll enroll you in that uh, class, or you can tell me whether you want to assign it to someone else or what you'd like to do. Okay, so remember, inch by inch. Your series seven is a cinch, yard by yard, whatever exam you have is hard. And uh, just as I said, what we're going to do now is I'm going to go over to, let me just put that up there for you. Do, 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 do. Hold on. I hate it when my mouse acts up on me. Come on, mouse. There we go. Okay, so this is where we're heading. Whoop, that's not it. We're heading over here. Oh, come on, mouse. My mouse is acting up. There we go. Uh, I'll be heading over there, and I'll be opening up a, a Zoom session at deantinneytutoring.setmore.com. You go to the class, and you'll see Q&A, and you'll see me there opening it, and I'll admit you. You shouldn't need admission, uh, but that's where I'll be. Okay, so any other uh, questions or comments here before... Those of you who are interested in overtime, I'll see you over there. Yeah, otherwise, I'll see the rest of you whenever I see the rest of you. Again, let me, my mouse is acting up. It looks like my batteries are dead. Okay. All right, everybody. Uh, see you next Tuesday, if not sooner. And I'll see you over at the, uh, uh, the Q&A session.